It's great to have you all in the house of the Lord this morning. Can we begin with just a word of prayer? God, thank you so much for the chance to be here with you, to speak of you, to talk about you, to have a moment where we all gather and praise you. So God, I pray that right here and right now that you can be here with us, that we are, our eyes are open to what you are doing, to the ways in which you're moving, in which you want to grow us. We pray that we are receptive to that calling. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So my wife, Cambria, and my dad are training for a triathlon. Yeah, amazing. And this is no ordinary triathlon, but this is not, this is not less like a short sprint distance triathlon, which I probably can't even do a sprint distance triathlon, but this is an Olympic length triathlon. It's a six mile run, it's a 25 mile bike, and it's a one mile swim. And I remember when Cambry was like, I want to do this and I want to do it for my birthday. I'm like, she's like, is this okay if this is my birthday present? I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's more than okay. It's like, you don't need any gifts from me. You just, I think you should do this. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be incredibly life-giving. Like, there's no need to, you don't need my wallet. Just, just a challenge. Just, just go ahead and run this triathlon, babe. It's going to be awesome. So this is, this is a big challenge. I, in my mind, if I could do one of the three, if I could do even just the six-mile run and do it well, I'd be like, I'm good. Thank you very much lived a good life, I'm ready to die. <laughs> but they have to do it back to back to back. And the thing is this, is that Cambria is in really, really good shape. She's been training really hard. I'm not worried about Cambria at all. I'm worried about my dad. <laughs> I'm worried a little bit about my dad because my dad is getting a little bit up there in age and his athletic ability went out of style right about the same time as bell bottoms. So it's a little bit in the past. And I'm a little bit nervous for him, but I give him credit because he's been training really, really hard. And he's got two of the three down. He's got the run and the bike, but he doesn't have the swim down. And this poor guy, he's literally been losing hair because of the swim. Just so stressed out about the swim. He's just like, I can't do it. He's texting Cambry like every day. Like, do you think we're going to make it? It's going to be so hard. I've been, I've been trying to do it, but I can't do it. Like a mile, so that's a long ways. Just swimming a mile in like really nice water would be very challenging. But this swim is a mile swim and it's in 48 degree water. That's some cold water. I don't know the last time you went swimming in 48 degrees. Well, it's, it's cold. That's really cold. And so my dad's just so stressed out about this. Like, how on earth am I going to, how am I going to do this? <laughs> so he gets this idea. He's like, okay, I have to swim in 40 degree, or 48 degree water. So I'm going to train in 40 degree water. Because that makes sense. <laughs> and so... So he doesn't live in Southern California. He lives up in Northern California. He's a pastor of a church up in Reading. And so he gets this idea. He's going to go swimming in, in a, a, a river called Whiskey River. And it's 40 degrees. Like this is no like warm, nice tropical waters. This is literally snow melt from Mount Shasta running into a river. And my dad's like, I'm going to jump in that. <laughs> he's really nervous about it. And so he gets this idea where he's like, you know what? I'm going to have my wife come with me and sort of be like a sense of motivation and encouragement for me. <laughs> so he talks my mom into it. And, and the thing about the Whiskey River is that it's a really wide river. It's a really wide and expansive river. And so he was a little bit worried that when he went swimming in this river that, that he wasn't going to be able to get out. Like, and, and, and when he swam in it, his, his hands became numb. His feet became numb. His face, he stopped, he stopped getting feeling in his face. And, and so he's like, you know, just in case I, you know, they get swept away by the current, I, I want to have my wife there to protect me and come and get me. And I wanted to be like, dad, um, I know mom loves you a lot, but if you start drowning in 40 degree water, you're dead. <laughs> She's not coming in after you. I'm sorry. That's not going to happen. So there my dad is. He gets into this 40 degree water and he's mapped out his route along this river and he's got these sort of landmarks along the way. And as he's swimming, my mom is walking right alongside next to him, giving him words of encouragement. And as he's swimming, he's staying right near the banks of the river. 
And as he's swimming, he's looking over to the side and he's, he's seeing these landmarks to make sure he's going in the right direction. He's getting closer and closer to the place in which he needs to go. Because there's something, there's something about being able to see dry land that gives you a sense of peace, of, of security, especially when you're in 40 degree water. <laughs> and so as my dad is swimming along this river, he's looking to his right to see where the water ends and the land begins. He's looking at the dry land to give him a sense of direction. The banks of the river are guiding my dad along the path in which he should go. And as he's telling me this story, he told me, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. It was so cold, it was miserable, I hated it. But he said, the thing that kept me going is the fact that I could see the land is the fact that when I could see that dry land, I knew I was going in the right direction. And as, I, as he's telling me this, I thought to myself, our beliefs are a bit like the banks of the river. If used in the right way, our beliefs guide us in the direction in which we should go. Are you with me? Our beliefs guide us. They propel us in the right direction. You have to have beliefs. Beliefs are important. They shape you and form you in thousands of different ways. If you don't have beliefs, if you lack the banks of the river, well, then there's no boundaries, and the water seeps out. It floods. The water, the river, can be incredibly damaging. And so the banks guide not only you along your journey, but they guide the water in which the way should go. It gives it direction and purpose and mission. Your beliefs give you a sense of identity and security. And much like these banks, as they guide the water, your beliefs, if used in the correct way, lead you into the deep, abundant, flowing waters of life in Jesus. Amen? This is where your beliefs lead. This morning, I want to share a passage with you out of the Gospel of John, John chapter 2, in fact. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open there this morning. Um, we have it up on the screen, and if you don't have it, you can just read along with me. Starting in verse 1. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars of water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. Verse 9, when the master of the ceremonies tasted the water, that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you, you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. How many of you have ever, how many of you have ever heard this story before? Raise your hand if you've ever read or heard or heard a sermon. Yeah, this is an incredibly well-known passage. It's a bit like the Easter passage. We've heard it time and time again. But I believe there's this morning, there's some really fresh stuff that I want to pull out. First off, don't you think this is an interesting beginning to Jesus's ministry? Have you ever noticed that? The first miracle John records in his gospel is Jesus turning water into wine. And more importantly than the miracle in and of itself, it's where this miracle takes place. Jesus' debut, the Messiah, the very Son of God who takes on human flesh, makes his entrance into ministry at a wedding. And not just a wedding, but a party. This is where Jesus begins his ministry. He enters into this. This is where he starts. And instead of of Jesus showing up with his arms crossed and his, brows, and his brow furrowed saying, you can't party. 
Jesus says the most fascinating thing. Jesus actually supplies what's necessary for them to keep on partying. Whoa. Fascinating, isn't it? This is the first miracle in the Gospel of John that he records. What an odd beginning. What a strange miracle. So let me set the scene a bit. We have a bridegroom, and this bridegroom runs out of wine. Now, in the ancient Jewish times, if you were to run out of wine, that's a big deal. That's like inviting your wife's relatives and this family and all her friends and your family and your friends and your relatives and you go out to a really nice dinner and you're eating and you're celebrating, you're loving it, and then comes the inevitable moment where the bill comes and you think to yourself, oh, oops, I ran out of money. I can't pay the bill. Awkward. What do you do? This is a huge deal. Nobody runs out of wine at a wedding in those days. If you did run out of wine, the shame of that event would follow the couple for years to come. This is a big deal. So Jesus' mom comes to the rescue. Mary says, hey, Jesus, we need some more wine. Jesus is like, no can do, mom. And in my mind, I imagine Mary giving Jesus the look that all mothers give their sons. How many know exactly what I'm talking about? Sweetheart, can you clean your room? Mom, I'm kind of busy right now. Let me rephrase that. Sweetheart, can you clean your room? Yep. I'll clean it. <laughs> it's that look that you know when, when you see it in your mother's eyes, if you don't obey, you're in trouble. Jesus says, Mom, I'm kind of busy right now. Um, I kind of have to save the world. No big deal. Uh, Jesus, we need some more wine. I can't do it, Mom. Jesus? Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. As every mother who gives this look, Mary gets what she wants. But at a deeper level, John is drawing a beautiful parallel here. This bridegroom runs out of wine. Now, wine is used many times in the Bible, and most notably in the Old Testament when the prophets are talking about the soon coming day of the Lord, the day in which abundance would come. And as they're talking about this abundance, this soon coming day of the Lord, they use the imagery of wine flowing from the hills. So in the Old Testament, wine came to represent abundance. This man runs out of wine, and John wants us to know. You know that abundance you've been waiting for? You know that wine that will cascade from the hills. It's here. It's now. It's present. It's with you. Jesus has come. The Son of God has cascaded from heaven and crashed into earth. The abundance is at hand. And the nature of this abundance is this, is that abundance fills what was previously empty. Notice Jesus' response to Mary's request. My time has not yet come. Jesus knows that not all people will be receptive to this abundance. Jesus realizes that some people, some people don't like the old shell to be filled with new living life. Some people would rather remain empty. But Jesus is abundance, and the abundance has arrived. And so we know the rest of the story. Jesus turns the water into wine, and the wine is brought to the master, and the master says, hmm, this is pretty good stuff. Usually they bring the best wine out first, but you have saved it until the very end. And so often when I've heard this story preached, I've heard it preached about, was it really wine? that Jesus turned it into? Was it fermented or unfermented? Seriously? <laughs> That's not what this passage is about at all. Honestly, I believe it was unfermented, but that's not the point. The point is not what the, the, the beverage is, but it's who the beverage came from. That's important. That's why it's refreshing. That's why the master takes note. But this morning, I'm not interested in the contents at all. I'm not interested in the wine. I'm interested in what the wine was held in. 
I'm not interested in the contents. I'm interested in the container. John gives us a fascinating detail. Verse 6. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. John includes this rather random detail into his account. By the way, there were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. (laughs) Thanks, John. (laughs) Random. Why on earth does he tell us this? And I have another question. What was wine normally held in in those days? I did a bit of research. Wine was held in one of two things in ancient Jewish times. Number one, wine skins. Number two, a clay pitcher called amphora. Now at a large event, like a wedding that Jesus is at, weddings would traditionally last from four to even two weeks long. Wine would be held in amphorae. Here's some of a picture of the ancient amphorae in those times. Now this amphora was made of clay. And this, this, this amphora was designed specifically for pouring wine. It had a handle on the side and a knob at the bottom that was perfectly used for pouring. It was just wide enough that it could be refilled with wine if needed and just narrow enough that it could be plugged if they wanted to save it until later. So according to tradition, Jesus is at a party. Jesus is at a wedding, a rather large gathering. The wine at the party Jesus is at would be stored in amphorae. So correct me if I'm wrong. Jesus is at a party. The wine runs out. That means there are tons of empty amphorae lying all around him. Yet Jesus doesn't request any amphorae, does he? He requests six stone jars. And by the way, these are the stone jars that were used for ceremonial washing. Why on earth does Jesus do this? Here's a picture of one of these stone jars. This is actually a stone jar found in Cana. This could be the very same stone jar that Jesus could have requested. Now, this, you can't tell from this picture, but these jars are massive, huge jars, holding up to 20 to 30 gallons, John tells us. Now, the difference is that these stone jars are made of solid rock, and they would be bore out through the, through, 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 um, the middle to hold this water. Now, what the difference is, is compared to the clay amphora, is that these stone jars are much less porous than the clay amphora. The reason why that's important is this, is that the water kept in these stone jars had to remain pure. If any impurities entered into this water, that was trouble. Because these stone jars were essential to the Jewish culture, to the Jewish religion. So at a party, before a Jew could eat, before they could drink, before they could even celebrate, a Jew would have to wash themselves in one of these jars. Once the water would be dirty, they would dump it out and they would fill it again. And they would wash themselves off and repeat the process. And more than a hygienic reason, Jews would wash themselves due to spiritual impurity. And so the reason they would wash themselves in this, this stone ceremonial washing jar is to not offend God. Jesus shows up at a party, the wine runs out, and he requests six stone ceremonial washing jars. And guess what he does with those jars? He takes the sacred water and he turns it into wine. Uh Uh-oh. In those days, this would have been a, a absolute violation of the religious practices in the Jewish culture. Absolute violation. If the religious authorities would have seen this, they would have flipped. This is crazy. Jesus mixes two things that should never, ever be mixed. Wine and water. And he does it in their sacred ceremonial washing jars. Jesus makes that water and he makes it into wine. Why? 
what on earth is Jesus up to? Why would Jesus intentionally and purposefully step on the toes of the religious leaders in those days? There's a brilliant quote from a woman that I love and admire in her book, The Desire of Ages. She says this about this exact same event. Jesus began the work of reformation by coming into close sympathy with humanity. While he showed the greatest reverence for the law of God, he rebuked the pretentious piety of the Pharisees and he tried to free the people from the senseless rules that bound them. Strong statement. The senseless rules that bound them. Because if we're not careful, religion, our beliefs, our practices, can rather than propel us forward, can hold us back, can become a burden can become work. Jesus came to free us from these. And so when Jesus enters into the scene, Jesus breaks down every possible barrier. He frees people from everything that could be holding on to them, which takes us back to the banks of the river. If our beliefs are the banks of the river, then Jesus came to call us into the deep and abundant waters. That is life in him, amen? If our beliefs are the banks of the river, they have to be there. They're vital, they're important. But a problem arises when we focus more on the banks than on the water, than on the flowing water of Jesus. A problem arises when we focus too much on the shore because too much of a good thing is always a bad thing. If we focus too much on our beliefs, the banks can eventually close in on themselves. And all of a sudden, this, 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 this flowing, abundant water becomes slow and stale and stagnant. This river that flows into the vast ocean of God's love becomes simply a pond. Jesus came to call us in to these deep waters. Now, some people may say when they hear this, well, this is proof that Jesus doesn't believe in religion. This is proof that Jesus doesn't believe in the institution of religion. Wrong. Notice that when Jesus shows up, he does not come in and break their ceremonial holy washing jars. He doesn't break them, he doesn't crush them, he doesn't destroy them. Because here's the truth, Jesus is never destructive in his nature. Jesus is never destructive, but rather, Jesus is profoundly creative. Jesus takes something that was used for this, and all of a sudden uses it for that. This now points to a greater truth. Jesus uses something. He fills it with something that people never could have imagined was possible. Because the thing about Jesus is Jesus is sheer creative force. And creativity, creativity isn't interested so much in preserving the old as it is in making old things new. So when Jesus enters into our life, into our faith, into our religion, Jesus stretches us. Jesus pulls us. Jesus morphs us, forms us in ways in which we never could have thought possible because that's the nature of who Jesus is. Abundance, creative passion, I never could have imagined I would have done that. We had two girls tell some testimonies last night at the way. And that's a phrase that was repeated over and over and over again. I was here in life and all of a sudden I met Jesus and he pulled me. He drew me into a place that I never thought possible. Jesus enters into a party and he fills 
these holy ceremonial washing jars with something that people never could have imagined could be filled in there. Jesus stretches, he pulls, he draws us. How many of you have ever been in an earthquake before? Raise your hand. Anybody? Everybody? Okay, yeah, we live in SoCal. Almost everybody's been in an earthquake. <laughs> it's not necessarily a uh, if you'll be in an earthquake, but it's a when. It's, it's, it's happening. It's coming. And there's all sorts of speculation about earthquake and the day in which when the earthquake comes, the whole city's just going to explode and what are going to happen. But the, the, the thing that I find fascinating about earthquake is the architecture that has, that has sort of arisen because of earthquakes. Architects have discovered that in order for a building to remain standing amidst an earthquake, the foundation has to be able to flex and move and bend. If the foundation is too stiff, it is too rigid, then the building will crumble. The architects discovered a fundamental truth that what does not bend will break. The same is true of our souls. When Jesus enters in, he bends us, he beckons us in ways that we never ever could have imagined. Jesus forces us to bend, to do things in which we never thought possible. So the question for you this morning is what areas in your life are holding you back from bending, from flexing, from allowing Jesus to stretch you and grow you? What is it in your life that's keeping you stiff and rigid? How limber is your soul? Are you ready? Are you ready for the God of the universe to take your sacred ceremonial washing jars and pour new and extravagant wine within them? Are you ready to leave the banks and dive into the deep and abundant waters of life in Jesus? Let's pray. God, we thank you for stretching us. We thank you for doing new and innovative and absolutely creative things in our lives. God, you change us, you form us, you morph us in ways we never would have known possible, but we have to be open and willing to be stretched, to be grown. God, give us this sense that you're, you are calling us, you are beckoning us into the deep and flowing and abundant waters that is life in you. And we pray this in your holy and blessed name. Amen.